Hello and welcome to this week's edition of The Front Page. We'll be digesting all the big stories from the world of racing over the next 30 minutes or so, uh, beginning with the action uh, from Cheltenham, but also looking at the latest in the John Dance case, the government's belated response to the affordability checks petition and the entrance of a certain somebody into the jungle. Um, but first of all, let me introduce you to my panel. Uh, joining me in the studio today is uh, Mr. Lee Morrisett, uh, fresh from uh, both a weekend at uh, Cheltenham and uh, an unfortunate injury. Yeah, very unfortunate. Um, I don't want people to feel too sorry for me, but on, on Thursday, I was taking part in a, in a circuits class. Uh, actually, it was just a one-on-one -on -one circuits class because nobody else turned up for it. Uh, my, my teacher, lovely man called Steve, is also a member of the owners group, so he had a good weekend. Fantastic. Stage star. Um, but one of Steve's great uh, passions in a circuit class is to lay out a series of mini hurdles, which you're then supposed to sort of jump like that, moving yeah. across. Yeah. And I did a bit of an Annie Power, and I got the final jump wrong, landed very awkwardly, uh, thought I'd broken my foot, still managed to get home. And as someone who's had a lot of fractures in the past, two elbows, mm. a foot, a nose, a little finger, I know what a break feels like. But on this occasion, I was wrong. Um, and viewers will be pleased to know it was only uh, torn ligaments and a sprain. It so, didn't stop you from getting to Cheltenham or indeed into the, the, the front page studio. So fair play to you. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, the gym class ended just a zero, which was a bit unfortunate. But, but yeah. you know, thank God he had the celebrations at, uh, at Cheltenham to make up for, for that, that slight um, yeah. disappointment there. Yeah, and, and, and I've got a diary item for later on as well. So, well, hey. P perfect stuff, yeah. perfect stuff. And joining us on video link from his East Anglian HQ is Peter Scargill. How are you, Pete? I'm good, yes, as as we were discussing, uh, looking sharp with my new haircut that my daughter did from yeah. me a few days ago. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pumped and ready to go and fully fighting fit, unlike other members of the team today. And just for the benefit of uh, the audience, Pete, how old is your daughter? She's six She's and six. she has amazing uh, clipper skills, as, say, as anyone watching the video can see. Fantastic. Excellent. OK, well, let's get straight in. We're going to uh, launch immediately into a piece of breaking news uh, because as of Monday morning, it has been announced uh, slightly surprising news that for the first time with Paul Nichols' uh, Brave Man's Game, his big hope for the Gold Cup will not be ridden by Harry Cobden in the Betfair Chase on Saturday. He will instead be ridden by former Ditch Heat partner Daryl Jacob. Uh, Lee, tell us about this story. Yes, so... Um Barry Orr, who um, produces the uh, marketing comms for Betfair, um, who sponsored Paul Nichols, put out a press release this morning uh, with quotes from Paul that said that Brave Man's Game is an intended runner in the Betfair chase on Saturday, depending on how the weather goes during the week. They don't want heavy ground, but the forecast looks pretty dry at the moment for Haydock. And that if he runs on Saturday, Daryl Jacob will ride him, and that Daryl had schooled the horse this morning. Um, he referenced Daryl's great experience. That was also obviously a multiple Betfair chase winner on Bristol Demai. And it was explained in the press release that Harry Cobden, Paul Stable jockey, um, is going to be at Ascot instead on Saturday for a number of important rides, one of which will be Peak Dorhey in the 1965 chase. Now, at face value, people will see this and think this is a bit unusual. Uh, in that Brave Man's Game is the highest profile horse in the yard. He's the King George VI chase winner. He's the Cheltenham Gold Cup second. Um, and he'll be marching towards both those races again this season. Um, and people will say it does seem odd that the stable jockey isn't riding the highest profile horse in the yard in the biggest race of the day on Saturday. Um, and they might also reference the fact that um, on Friday at, As at Cheltenham, um, Paul wasn't happy with the ride that Harry gave Captain Teague in a grade two novice hurdle. And he spoke about that in my colour piece uh, from Cheltenham on Saturday. But he'd been very happy with a ride on stage star at, a, at Cheltenham on Saturday in the Paddy Power Gold Cup. And um, I'm told this morning from uh, within the, the, the setup there that it read, there is nothing uh, suspicious about it. It is purely that Harry has a big book of rides or Paul has a big team of runners at Ascot on Saturday headed by Pete Dorhey and that Brave Man's Game might not run at Haydock anyway, depending on the weather. And therefore, it's simply um, they see it as a sensible deployment of resources 
at Haydock on uh, Haydock and Ascot on Saturday. I suppose what would be interesting is Brave Man's game goes and wins by ten lengths and produces a stellar performance. Then there'll be some people inevitably saying, yeah, "Will mm. Darrell Jacob keep the ride in the King George VI Chase?" But prior to now, Harry Cobden has been the only jockey ever to ride Brave Man's game, and I don't think anybody would would say that Harry has um, done a bad job in that at mm. all. No, eighteen uh, runs, eighteen times Harry Cobden has taken the ride. It's inevitable people will sort of um, talk about this and will question whether there is anything else um, afoot here, especially given um, you know, you know, Paul, Paul Nichols was always very upfront, and, and as you as you quoted on uh, Saturday, you know he, he wasn't totally happy with Harry's performance on Friday. So it, it is inevitable that people will therefore take two and two and come up with their own conclusion. Yeah, they, they will, clearly. And, of course, the irony is that Daryl Jacob used to be the number one um, uh, f for Paul Nichols, and he, he too, was um, replaced later on by, by Sam Tristan Davis, who was replaced by, by Harry Cobden. And, and these things happen um, within yards. But I think on when Paul was speaking on Saturday about that Captain Teague ride, again, he was very clear and specific in what he thought was wrong. He, he, he explained why, tactically, he thought they'd got it wrong with Captain Teague. He also referenced the fact um, when we spoke that Harry had had a fall on Thursday, which he thought maybe impacted his riding on Friday, but that he had been delighted with his ride on Stage Star. Mm. Um, and Harry Cobden, in general terms, is a jockey whose star has very much been in the ascendancy. Um, he's second in the jockey's championship race. He does still have a chance of being champion jockey. Um, he is, generally speaking, riding incredibly well. So I think if you look at the bigger picture, it would seem odd if um, Harry Cobden was being um, jocked off Brave Man's game on Saturday. And I say within the camp, they are clear that that isn't the case. It is simply, say, they're saying, uh, a sensible way to deploy their jockeys on Saturday. Let's turn to Cheltenham. Uh, you were there reporting for the Racing Post over, over the weekend. Um, we've already mentioned Stage Star, obviously one of the highlights of the meeting. But what, what for you was the standout performance that you were taking away from the three-day meeting? Um, standout performance, I'd say, was Burdett Road in the juvenile hurdle, the Grade 2 Triumph Trial on Saturday. Um, and I'd say... I reference that not only because it was a particularly impressive performance, given a very confident ride by Harry Cobden, who dropped him out of the back, um, recognised what his mount could do in terms of producing a turn of foot, gave him plenty to do, but the horse did it uh, and won really impressively. But what I think was particularly important about that horse's win on Saturday is that Burdett Road is the textbook example of the sort of horse that British jump racing has been lacking. He's a 103 rated flat horse. He's listed group three class on the flat. He's exactly the type of horse that would once have been switching mm. from a flat racing career to two mile hurdling, going supreme, triumph, and then champion hurdle route. Exactly the sort of horse that we have been missing. Uh, and that's why champion hurdles and grade one hurdles in Britain in recent years have been particularly weak because that sort of horse now generally speaking is sold to go racing on the flat in Australia or Hong Kong or the Middle East. To their credit, the Gredley family um, turned down offers for Burdett Road. Now they're clearly a, they're a wealthy family so they're, they're, not, they're not in need of the cash but they could have cashed in on Burdett Road. Tim Gredley, Bill Gredley's son, made the point on Saturday that the sensible thing would have been to sell but they're in it to enjoy watching their horses race and they were mindful of the fact that Burdett Road is exactly yeah. the sort of horse that we've been missing. Thankfully we've got him. So I thought that was a, my, my single performance of the week. I thought Stasar was uh, super in the Paddy Powergold Cup given again a great ride by, by Harry Cobden. We had that drama at the final fence. And I thought really interesting yesterday on Sunday. We, we speak about the, the, the Nichols-Cobden combo earlier on. It was a big Sunday for Nico de Boinville and Nicky Henderson. Um, both their big winners, John Bond and Iberico Lord, are owned by JP McManus. Um, it's well documented that JP decides who rides his horses. On many occasions within seven barrows, that is Nico de Boinville. But on some high-profile horses, including John Bond, it hasn't been. Um, 
in separate interviews I did last jump season with Nico and with Nick Henderson, they both spoke about the fact that, of course, they would like Nico to be riding more of the horses, but they spoke very diplomatically. Uh, Nico has handled that situation with real dignity, and I think it was an important day for him on, on Sunday at Cheltenham. Nicky made that point as well, um, but it was a, important for, for Nico to have won both those races. And whilst nobody would be happy that Aidan Coleman wasn't able to ride, because like Nico, he's one of the weigh room's good guys, that there'd have been a lot of delight that, that uh, Nico had a chance to shine on those two horses and did a really good job. So what lots we, of interesting things at Cheltenham. What weekend. did we learn from, from John Bond's victory as well? Um, I think we learned that El Fabiolo does have a serious challenger in the champion chase. You look at the champion chase market, it's pretty depressing. You've got two horses under 20 to 1 in the betting, one at even money, one at 5 to 2, 20 to 1 bar that. It looks like a two horse race. Um, and if you looked at last year's Arkle, or last season's Arkle, you'd be saying it's a one horse race because El Fabiolo beat John Bunn convincingly. But I think Nicky Henderson is adamant that we didn't see the real John Bunn in the Arkle last season. And when it was put to him on Sunday, can you see this horse reversing the form with El Fabiolo next March? He said, yes, he can. And I think based on what we saw on Sunday, if you're a supporter of John Bunn for the champion chase in March, you will have gone away encouraged by what you witnessed, particularly as that was his first run of the season. Uh, Pete, it wasn't just Cheltenham in action at the weekend, we also had uh, Navin's new festival. Uh, probably the standout star there was Fasal Vega. What did you make of uh, Fasal Vega's victory? Well, I would be no expert when it comes to assessing a horse's jumping and how they do things over fences, but he seemed quite proficient. There was a couple of uh, novice mistakes that I suppose you would expect from a novice. Um, but in general, look, he's a horse. He was extremely good in bumpers. Uh, he's extremely good over hurdles, and he's going to be extremely good over fences, isn't he? Um, and no doubt he'll be plotted towards the Cheltenham Festival very efficiently by Willie Mullins. Um, the horse is second in the pocket, quite a few wise as well, I think, in terms of the future. So, um, like encouraging there from from both of those horses, um, and hopefully some some extra depth to the to the novice chase department um, when we come around to the spring races, rather than scaring people off so you know that he was he was certainly good it was good to see bob oninger win um probably not quite as impressively as it looked when he loomed up on the bridle but given how good he was going to be and how good he uh, proved not to be last season if that makes sense uh, it was nice to see him get his head back in front uh, gordon elliott just about scraped in in the troy town with his 15 runners uh, <laughs> 14, 14, 14 runners in the end uh, pete in fairness we should say Good point, Tom. I hold my hands up. Accuracy is very important. Um, obviously, Gavin Cromwell, who's um, you know his record at Cheltenham to go back to Cheltenham, he's five winners from twelve runners this year. He's a guy who's proven very effective at, at targeting races, uh, big races, nearly upset the, the Elliot party there. So look, that was that was good. And I've got one other. Oh yes, Captain Guinness uh, in the Fortria. He was good as well. But obviously, that really only served. Uh, Boost John Bond really didn't give him John Bond beat him out of sight when they last met. So um, yeah, look, it, it, it seemed to work well the Navin weekend. Obviously, I wasn't there, but um, it seemed to work well as a as a, a double header rather than as a, a single meeting uh, and some interesting and eye catching performances. You'd have thought. Uh, also, not at Navin was Navin's finest, uh, David Jennings, because instead he was at Cheltenham. And Lee, he wrote a very uh, interesting piece speaking to some of his compatriots. Um, it's in today's paper and online for members now, basically talking about how the November meeting has become the new festival for, for, for plenty of Cheltenham aficionados. It's qu slightly quieter, the town, you, it's easier to get, uh, get around the place, the race course in the town, get tables, restaurants, whatever. The atmosphere is still great, the racing is still great. Um, and Cheltenham are leaning into this big time. They get about 60,000 over the three days. They're aiming to make that 70,000 within the next couple of years. You know, what's your assessment of it? Do you think the November meeting is just going to go from strength to strength? And, and is it better than the festival? No, it's not. It's very good. Um, what's not to enjoy? Three days at Cheltenham, quality racing. But for me, uh, the festival towers above everything else. That's not to say I, I didn't really enjoy the November meeting, the open that was. Um, and um, I can absolutely understand why those Irish race goers that DJ spoke to said they prefer November. I know a lot of, a lot of other people do as well because for the point that you laid out, mm. it, as a customer experience, 
it's bound to be more enjoyable if you can just get around. More affordable as well. Absolutely, more affordable, yeah. more enjoyable. One thing I would say about the November meeting, um, and I, I'd have, I was looking to try and get it into one of the, the two colour pieces right over the weekend, but events overtake you and you, you only have a certain amount of space. And uh, I already annoy subs enough by trying to overwrite um, and get more than I should do. But there were two consecutive handicaps on Saturday. Three mile handicap hurdle, and a two mile five furlong intermediate handicap hurdle whose prize money was less than it was 20 years ago. Now, we generally associate this sort of thing with race courses that aren't Cheltenham, um, but those two races are contests I've picked up on in the past in copy and noted that their prize money is way below what it used to be. Um, the three mile handicap hurdle in particular was worth £30,000 on Saturday, it was worth £40,000 in 2003, it was worth £55,000 in 2004, it's now worth thirty grand. Now, you could argue that one reason for that is that at Haydock on Saturday, also a jockey club track, you've got a £125,000 three mile handicap hurdle. One's a class one, one's a class two, but they're basically the yeah. same race, they're open three mile handicap hurdles. So perhaps one race doesn't really fit in the programme, um, perhaps things need to be tickled and amended, but I did think it was odd, and I do think it's odd, that you have two races like that, that maybe aren't getting the, the fields as strong as they could be, certainly intermediate hurdles are a lot weaker than it was in the past, and they are worth considerably less than was once the case, and I think we, we pick up on that for, for race courses outside of the elite tracks. I think it's only fair that when we it's see it with an elite track, we do pick up it's on It's also the case, actually, at some of the festival contests, oh, absolutely. where some yeah. of the prize money pots yeah. are very low, considering the prestige and the crowds and everything and the betting activity. But I think that's a topic for another day, because uh, we, we go down the prize money route at our peril <laughs> if we want to get through the rest of the show. Um, we're just going to take a very quick uh, break for an advert for our latest Members Club Ultimate offer. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to dive straight into our next story now. Uh, Pete, I'm going to come to you because you've been following the John Dance case very closely over the uh, last few months. Um, tell us what's the latest and, and give a very brief recap of the story to date. Sure. So a um, couple of developments last week in terms of the uh, ongoing cataloguing of um, the, the dance situation. I'm going to call it the dance situation for now. Um, so first of all, there was the um, intimate, intimate. No, it, it was an intimate report, but an intermediate report, a six-month report from the um, special administrators who've been looking at Welsh Tech LLP, which was dancers company that went into, um, you know, it was shut down in April after the discovery of serious regulatory and operational issues by the Financial Conduct Authority which is the city regulator. So there was a six month um, review that was uh, in, uh, investigation that was published. Um, some interesting insights into that, particularly the suggestion that, that the, the administrators were having some real difficulty untangling what was been going on there. Um, the records were, were very uh, difficult to follow. Uh, they'd have to do a lot of um, analysis of financial transactions to try and understand uh, how there'd been an 80 million back hole develop 80 million down from 81 million so they found a million quid so that's a start isn't it um uh, they talked about there being um the, the company's been run as a, as, a, as a you know with a gap in their finances for a prolonged period of time so this isn't something that's just developed it's something that's clearly um built and built and built so that was you know that was one aspect giving us some insight into what was going on I'm, on I'm, top I'm, of that pete just sorry just very quickly to jump in there um just, just for uh, for the readers' benefit, how is this likely to unfold? Is it is this a case that is going to end up in in the high court? 
it looks that way unless some sort of deal is is struck. So um, the fact that the Financial Conduct Authority amended the freezing order they had in place. So they had a freezing order that went in place in April, immediately after Wealth Tech LLP was shut down. And this is what caused all the issues with Brave Man's Game running at Aintree and not running at Aintree. And Brian Drew having to buy John Dance out. You'll all remember the, the drama that happened mm. with that around the bowl chase and then the punch down Gold Cup. Um, so they changed that from a, from a £40 million worldwide freezing order, which was a civil um, uh, piece of a uh, piece of documentation to a restraint order and a restraint order is something it can only be it basically protects assets um for future confiscation after a, a criminal um after a criminal trial after you know a criminal finding against someone so the fca are, are you know they've, they've kept their cards quite close to their chest there hasn't been a lot of detail coming out of this investigation but you know there's little tweaks and little um tightenings of what's going on which give you a a good indication of the direction of travel on this one i have to say and there's obviously been a huge number of people who have been caught up in this uh, both investors in some of dancers companies but also the people who have been involved with his racing activities uh, one of them is uh, is of course james horton who was his private trainer uh, he has um moved on effectively tell us what's happened what's what's james latest movement yeah so david Mills, our new market correspondent spoke with james this week or last week i should say you need to get my dates right um so he james horton is going to move into uh, park lodge stables in central Newmarket, it's the uh, old yard of Harry Eustace. Harry Eustace, very upwardly mobile trainer, is moving to other premises. Um, I understand he's moving to premises on Berry Road, although that's not confirmed yet. You know, a bigger place for his more horses. So everything is is um, sort of disintegrating and melting away around Dance's racing empire. Um, obviously, his horses can't run at the moment. Um, but you know, obviously there's a lot of things that, that are, are unclear and still need to be sorted out, hopefully in time for the next flat season, I suppose, because, you know, that's where the majority of dancers horses are, are focused. So it could do with not dragging on. And obviously, it's quite a complex financial investigation. It's um, it's all a bit of a mess, really, Tom. It certainly is, but we'll be continuing to follow that story closely and you'll get all the latest developments in the Racing Post and online. Um, another story we, of course, have been following extremely closely is the saga around affordability checks and the government uh, policy, uh, which seems to be slowly sort of evolving over time, um, has taken an, another slight and interesting turn following their response to the petition against the checks. This petition, launched by uh, Jockey Club Chief Executive Nevin Truesdale, is uh, now up to almost 90,000 signatures. When it gets to 100,000, it will be considered for a debate in Westminster. Uh, but in the meantime, the government have given their response to the petition, and it's quite a lengthy and detailed response. We analysed it in detail, and that's, that's available again on the Racing Post website, and we'll put a link to it in the description. Um, but we thought we would touch on the key points of the analysis on the show today. I mean, first of all, it's worth stressing that the government policy is effectively unchanged. They say that they remain committed to implementing uh, what they call a frictionless system of affordability checks in order to prevent people uh, incurring what they call uh, unaffordable losses on their gambling. However, there is an interesting development because for the first time we can see the debate sort of coalescing into two distinct areas. On the one hand, we have the government's proposals for checks. These have been scrutinised at length and spoken about at length, that whether they're going to be truly frictionless, how much damage they will cause to racing, and how much inconvenience they will cause uh, to betters have all been major points of conversation. But now, interestingly, we begin to see a focus on what happens before those checks are introduced, what happens in the interim. And for a long time, uh, we and others in racing and, and betting communities have been trying to make this point exactly clear, which is that while the government policy is important, in the meantime, we already have affordability checks being extremely widely applied 
uh, perhaps as many as one in five regular racing punters already having been affected by them. And action is being sought on that point as well because at the current time people are not only being uh, confronted by these very invasive uh, requests for their financial documents but the sport is also seeing a decline in its revenues uh, from betting. Um, Lee, I guess the thing to say here would be that they haven't actually taken any action no. about the interim checks but they have for the first time acknowledged them and made clear that they want to see an improvement in that situation. They want to see more transparency and more consistency. Um, I suppose it's, it's sort of a very small positive step in the right direction. Yeah, and given there have been so few steps in the right direction, you have to welcome it. Um, the, government, the Gambling Commission has never really acknowledged that bookmakers are imposing affordability checks because the Gambling Commission insists they should do. There's never been a specific directive on this one from the, um, the Gambling Commission. There had in the past been clear statements about mm. what its view were on, on affordability checks and at one point it wanted almost everybody to um, get caught up in this seemingly. Um, but at least by this response, the government has acknowledged that this is a problem in the here and now. Uh, it's spoken about conversations with the Gambling Commission and the Betting and Gaming Council with a view to try and producing at least a more uniform approach to how affordability checks are being uh, implemented at the moment. Um, but, it, but it's still the whole thing still just becomes ever more frustrating. You know, you, you, you have a system where the government is talking about not wanting to implement formalised affordability checks until it knows there is a frictionless system for doing that and that system has been trialled. And at the same time, it's saying we want the current model of affordability checks to be uniform. Mm. Now, if anyone watched this from a different planet would look at what is being said and say none of this makes sense, this can't really be happening. Yeah. And, but and, it really is. And the, the, I guess the frustrating thing here is it is not that complex for them to impose uh, transparency and consistency on the existing system. All it requires is a, a, a sort of a clear and unequivocal statement from the government about what is expected from bookmakers in the interim. So if they said, for example, you know, this is the figure below which we do not believe uh, better should ever be um, asked for personal financial yep. documentation, then that would be the point at which bookmakers would know they could uh, draw the line. Yeah. But in the absence of that, there basically there is no solution. And I think this, is, this sort of talks to the government's um, desire to have an answer that pleases everyone. They want to simultaneously get racing um, and the racing media off its back. They want to avoid offending punters. They want to avoid causing damage to horse racing. They also simultaneously are terrified that the anti-gambling lobby uh, and its outriders in the media are going to uh, pounce on them if they do anything concrete, which seems like a step away from the from the, the quite intrusive regime that they have outlined in the white paper, which leaves them in this impossible situation. They seemingly want um, someone else on a sort of a nod and a wink to to agree to do something that will get them out of it. But it's just yeah. it is just not going to work, is it? It's not going to work, and I think it highlights the extent to which the gambling commission. The, the industry regulator, has become almost a liability um, for the government in the sense that the, the government's position is clear on one front in the sense that we, this shouldn't be happening. We don't want formalised affordability checks until the system is in place that we know they can work properly. Yeah. And yet you have the government's gambling industry regulator has already created a situation whereby these checks are happening at all sorts of different levels across the betting market, causing all sorts of frustration to, to punters and all sorts of damage 
to the British racing industry. And I sense from the, uh, the, the language that we are hearing at the moment that the government is perhaps starting just to become a little bit frustrated with the position its industry regulator has put itself in. You know, I, I, I don't imagine, we, as you say, the government doesn't want to be in this situation. It knows it's got a hot potato, a really difficult hot potato to handle, but that hot potato has been made ever hotter mm. because of the Gambling Commission. One other point I thought was worth picking up in, in the response, um, we published a series of articles called the Affordability Files mm -hmm. uh, in the last couple of months. You, you worked on them yep. uh, with our industry editor, Bill Barber. One of those articles uh, looked at the estimate, estimate DCMS put on the damage to racing as a result of its checks. It said it would be a maximum of 14.9 million. Uh, we did a very forensic piece looking at this uh, and came to the very clear conclusion that that 14.9 million figure was a mistake. It was based on some flawed understandings of British racing's revenue models um, and some pretty simplistic uh, extrapolation and yep. mathematics in order to arrive at that figure. The government have said they are working with racing to refine that estimate. It is essentially an admission that they got it wrong and that the entire premise on which these checks are based is flawed. Yeah, um, we knew that already, you know, that, that's the frustrating thing, that so much of this has been blindingly obvious, mm. you know, not, none of this is a surprise, that so much of the, of the foundations on which this, this white paper um, has been built were always going to crumble. It was, it was clear that, that, that this was built on uh, assumptions and guesswork and estimates. And wishful thinking, and wishful checks, thinking. for example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the very fact that this, this policy is built around being able to carry out frictionless checks when the originator of the policy knows at the moment you can't do those frictionless mm. checks. I mean, it's utterly ridiculous. It is extraordinary. Um, the petition, like I say, is at uh, almost 90,000 signatures. If and when it gets to 100,000, which I'm sure it will do, it will be considered for debate in Westminster. And hopefully if that happens, there will be some enhanced scrutiny of some of these uh, measures. However, from the ridiculous to the ridiculous, we are going to conclude with the entry of a certain Frankie de Tory into uh, the I'm a celebrity, get me out of here jungle. Uh, he's not there yet, uh, but he apparently we will be there. He, apparently he's going to be arriving late. Um, he's, he's as big as nines to win it, the same price as Nigel Farage. Read into that what you will. Um, someone called Danielle Harold is the favourite, and another person called Sam Thompson is the, is the Racing Post tip. Put up at sixes, now no bigger than nine to two. Still value? I don't know who he is. Um, what do we think? What do we think? How's Frankie going to get on in the jungle? Don't care remotely. Oh, come on. No, Luke. no, no. I not, thought you were a fan that's of not reality fair. TV. No, 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 no. I'm a strictly fan. Yeah. Tom, and I would <laughs> a much, more refined form I, of... Yeah, I would yeah. much refer, prefer if, if Frankie had opted uh, to go down a reality TV journey that um, afforded him more dignity and enabled him to learn the cha-cha-cha. Um, that hasn't happened. No. I've got to be honest, I'm not a, a watcher, a viewer of, of I'm a Celebrity, um, although I know that millions of people are. Um, I'm sure it will be very effective at boosting um, his, his profile. Um, I do think it's a bit odd if he goes in on the basis that we now know he is planning to um, have a full-time career as an American-based jockey. I think this made more sense if, we, mm. if he just retired, but hey-ho. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, he's, just, he, he's done this before. I, I remember I interviewed him before Royal Ascot, and the, the jungle thing was being talked about then, and I mentioned it to him, and his response was along the lines of, yeah, yeah, I've done all that stuff before. I'm grand. I, I, I can do it. You know, and he's done it when he was in Big Brother. He, um, he did an impression of Mussolini, did a drag act. 
Uh, he knows he knows how to play the game. He's a performer, and okay. he will perform, I'm sure. Um, he did uh, an impression of Mussolini. Yeah, I think he dressed up as Mussolini and did a drag act, I think. Yeah. Different, Which, different times. Not, yeah, not at the same no, time. No, different times. Okay, a, yeah. a drag Mussolini would, yeah. be a, would be an interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I'm sure he'll, he'll, he'll do very well. But m my, my problem is, and this sounds terribly pompous, but I don't know who the majority of the people in there are, and therefore trying to, trying to compare Frankie relative to them is difficult mm. at this stage. Um, and I just hope when the call comes in for live reporting on this mission, it goes to somebody else. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, Pete, oh. how about you? Um, you must be a I'm a celebrity fan. You can see it's written all over my yeah. face how much I'm looking forward <laughs> who, to it. Who, if you could, if you, if you could pick from the entirety of racing, uh, who do you think would get on best? In, in the jungle, and perhaps more interestingly, who would get on worst? Who would guess on best and who would guess on worst? Now there's an enjoyable, there's an enjoyable topic. I mean, part of it is, is given the things that people have to do, you're tempted to put people in the jungle who maybe haven't been so nice to you over the years to see them, <laughs> you know, dealing with Bush Tucker Charles. I mean, I see that Nigel Farage um, was wading through uh, waist deep brown sludge on the first day, a metaphor perhaps for his career. And, uh, you know, he's, he's immediately been voted into the Bush Tucker trial. So, um, you know, someone, I mean, you know, over the years, I've, I've uh, upset enough people who, who perhaps would like to see me in the jungle. And given that racing's, you know, got Frankie in there and we had Matt Hancock last year, um, you know, perhaps racing is, is developing its own um, little niche and I'm a celebrity. And anyway, Lee, you're talking about the cha-cha-cha with Frankie. Yeah. Could Frankie and Farage not cha-cha-cha together? I mean, that's got to be social media gold if nothing else across the across yeah. the camp yeah come with, on we, we're gonna think creatively here with one dress as Mussolini and the other doing a drag act that would that would that would work that would work if we're being slightly serious <laughs> on this one I suppose what we should say is there are so few people within racing's parish that would actually even be considered hmm. for a program like this you know, maybe we, just Frankie. Frankie. Also, Although, actually, looking at the others, the, the threshold is not that high. No, but having said that, <laughs> we are maybe not reflective <laughs> of, of the, the, the audience. The, yeah, no. and I, I, I would freely admit mm. um, that I'm not necessarily completely au fait with what with what young people are watching and enjoying, and therefore I am probably the sort of old fogey who is never going to really know who 80% of the people on the programme are. But there are very few people in our parish who would even be considered for this sort of thing. Once upon a time, they'd have gone to people like John McCreary, mm. um, sort of Claire Balding has that sort of status, but there aren't many who you'd many. think... Our producer's just told us Willie Carson did it as well. Yes, producer Sam <laughs> has, has just reported, to my great shock, <laughs> Did, Willie, did you know Willie Carson? No, 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 no. I've no. never been. I've never been a big, big no. jungle aficionado. No. I have to be honest. Well, that, um, that was nice though for Willie. Um, I'm sure he enjoyed it. He did well, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you get to go to a nice Australia's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. And on that bombshell, uh, the world's finest. Uh, I'm a celebrity betting uh, preview brought to you by the Rating Post. We do actually have a better one online, uh, which I do uh, recommend in the sports section. Um, Lee, we need to decide what goes on the front page. You're normally in this seat. Yeah. Um, how did you find the, um, the um, flip? Well, on the basis that when I'm in your seat, mm. um, and as someone who lives with a, with a, with a very difficult guilt complex, oh. I find it very hard to give myself the prize. Mm. On that basis, if I were you, I'd be looking at someone with a heavily bruised foot um, who very rarely gives himself the prize, and I'd be saying, might be quite nice. If you gave him the prize. Good, it's yeah. good, excellent, excellent guilt complex. Thank you. Um, nice. I, I'm I'm immune to guilt though, so oh. uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna put the petition response on the front page. The petition closing in on a hundred thousand signatures. Uh, the biggest story in racing right now. Um, hopefully, it will not be forever. Um, but that is it for this week um thank you very much lee for joining me it's a pleasure to have you in the studio and thank you very much pete as well and thank you at home uh for joining us for this week's edition of the front page we'll be back next week with all the biggest stories in the sport much more debate 
And before we go, do take a look at uh, our latest enhancements to the Racing Post app and give it a download. Thanks again for joining us. You spoke, we listened. Introducing Race Cards Redefined. Three brand new and unique race cards tailored for your needs. Our new and improved standard race card is the punter's favourite and is everything you need to make your selection. Get the maximum amount of information in the palm of your hand with Expert View. Cover all areas and get all the same information as our newspaper. With Compact View, you can make a quick decision on who to back. View more runners and more odds on one race. Which race card will you choose?